Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us at the Free Market Foundation's media, brief media and member briefing on uh, the financial services industry phase, the harbinger of things to come. Um, we're delighted to have uh, with us as a guest speaker, Professor Robert Vivian, who is Professor of Finance and Insurance, the School of Economics and Business Science at WITS. He's no stranger to the Free Market Foundation. I'm sure you've all heard him before. He's also often in the media talking about this subject. He will be joined by our Executive Director, Leon Lowe, who will also have some, some comments to make. Um, I've just remembered, I've forgotten to say who I am. For those who don't know me, I'm Jane Boccalioni, and I look after media and communications for the Free Market Foundation. This is a big subject. It's not an easy subject for the lay person to get to grips with. Nevertheless, it's very important for anyone, any consumer, or anyone who has dealings with the um, insurance industry, buys insurance, uh, and consumes cons uh, insurance products. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Robert, our first speaker, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. <laughs> Let me see if I can pilot this thing correctly. Okay, we want to look at phase, the whole bringer of things to come. What's the whole bringer? Or bring as a person who goes in front to tell you what's about to come. So uh, we have previously the Free Market Foundation and presented on the Twin Peaks, the new dispensation which is going to come. We've spoken about phase. So we didn't want to repeat what we've already said. So what we thought we'd take a slightly different approach. So we know we've got Twin Peaks. What's going to happen? To understand that, let's have a look at what we've learned from where we've come. So we see phases pointing the way forward. So that's what we want to do in this particular presentation. As soon as I get to how to work with me. Okay. So what have we got at this particular point of time where we are? We've got phase. For those who do not know, it stands for the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Act, Act 37 of 2002. I have in brackets 2004. Because although it was passed in 2002, it took two years to come to become operational. So when we look at the data, we start in 2004, but it doesn't mean that uh, we didn't look at the previous years. There was nothing to talk about because it took two years for it to, 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 to be implemented. And what uh, I will argue is that it marked a vastly different approach uh, to law. We've never seen that before in South Africa, as we will see. Because we live through it today, we think this is normal. It was not normal in 2002 and became more and more abnormal as time progressed. And a very important statement by one of the world's leading historians, Lord Acton. He said, you must bear in mind that power tends to expand indefinitely until it's stopped by a more superior power. So when things go in a particular direction, they don't stop because people think it's a different way. They get stopped because people realize it shouldn't be in that direction and the new direction is uh, put into place. So we can get things going somewhere else and then we need to be very careful. We understand what's happening and see whether we like it at all. And what we'll argue is that uh, the Twin Peaks legislation, we're going to go in the same direction where we started in phase and that's what's going to happen. So it will just continue. Why? Because nobody said anything other than the Free Market Foundation, as far as I can make, that we think that the system should be, we should look at it very carefully and go in a different direction. Okay, now, if we say there's a new direction, it will help us to go back uh, to 2001 and say, where were we? So, if we change direction in 2001, what was the direction as to it? So, the way we were before phase came in, and uh, it can be summarized very simply. The rule of law, particularly the common law of contracts. And that's what governed the relationship between financial institutions and the public. That was the only way which uh, it, it mean, didn't mean we didn't have a parliament. So for all the years that uh, we had the financial industry, which is about uh, 300 years, were they doing nothing? No, they did a little bit. And we also had courts. We had courts who listened to uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of cases involving the financial industry, millions of cases around the world. Did they do nothing? No, I mean, they did something. So let's have a look what they did in this uh, story that we were. So what parliamentary interventions did we have over a 300-year period? So 
what we had, as we will see and becomes more and more clear, uh, a system which had evolved and very served us very well, common law of contracted, common law of contract refined incrementally throughout the world by the judges under the co control ultimately of a Supreme Court, a single court in England, the House of Lords, in South Africa, the appellate division, in America, the Supreme Court. So there's always uh, those uh, two things. And I'll put in worldwide, because if you know anything about a court case, if you're going to argue a case, nothing stops you from drawing jurisprudence from other parts of the world. So our courts, and all courts around the world, are influenced around there. And we ended up with what I call the two great triumphs. Earlier this week, an article I wrote was published in the Business Day. The two great triumphs, the great triumph of the common law and the great triumph of the Supreme Court. These two working together to end up with a general law which worked fantastically well. So well that we had very little intervention from anybody and under these sorts of circumstances. I emphasize very, 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 very few interventions. So it's not as if uh, this was everybody fast asleep, everybody was keeping an eye on the ball, but there was nothing to change. So I drew attention to the only ones that, uh, that I could isolate from Parliament. So we had Section 75 of this Insurance Act, which is part of our Insurance Act. And that was a very strange thing. It says it was a criminal offence to induce persons to enter into insurance with an unregistered person. So why would we pass such a strange requirement? And I must tell you, these requirements are three lines long. So they were not 120 pages long. They were just three lines saying what you can't do. Well, that came from a case in the United States in 1868. Paul versus Virginia, what had happened is that uh, Mr. Paul lived in Virginia and he was representing insurers which were in New York State. And Virginia regulated insurance and they were very unhappy that Yari was selling insurance on a company they could not control. So they then tried to stop him and he then argued, you can't stop me because I'm selling insurance from a, from a uh, company which is not in the state, you can't control the state. And because I'm working across state lines, that's interstate commerce, and interstate commerce is a federal thing, and until federal passes a law, there's nothing you can do. So that eventually wound its way all up. And so we were alerted to the fact, remember I said, hundreds of millions of cases all around, all the different courts, and so the world was alerted to the problem that you can have a person selling insurance in a country with a person who's not regulated. So we made a very simple rule that you can't induce people to enter into a contract with an unregistered person. And in all my years, I don't think that was ever applied to anybody. So, But it was there, and, it, and people knew about it, and they governed their life according to it. So a four-line intervention as a, resp as a result of a court case which took place in, in 1868. So not there. And in South Africa, we introduced, a, in, in 1969, we introduced a change to our law uh, because of a court case, New Zealand versus Jordan. In that case, a person took out a life policy and he accidentally overstated his age. So let us say an example. He said he's 20. He said that he was 21 when he was actually 25. Now, if he says he is 21, the insurer would have charged him a greater premium because the risk is greater for young people. He should have got a lower premium and therefore the insurer should have been quite happy about it, but the insurer decided to repudiate the claim on the basis that it was a breach of a material term in the contract. About two years earlier to that, Professor Boberg had warned that this might happen, uh, and the insurance industry were quite incensed that he suggested they would do that. They did exactly what he said they did. So Parliament said, well, if you don't want to behave yourself, we will change the law. You can only repudiate a claim when there's a material misrepresentation. So there's uh, 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 two great interventions in a 200-year period. Nothing much to happen, which we've got. Of course, we have other provisions in the Act, but they're there all for regulatory purposes. So, for example, Lloyds was selling insurance. Lloyds is an individual selling in person. We didn't know how to tax an individual from overseas, so they had to introduce the Lloyds provision, which introduced a premium policy tax, which Lloyds paid under there. So, no real significant interventions. Now, our courts, of course, deal with insurance matters uh, every day. Uh, one of the most heavily litigated areas is, is insurance, and so our courts have been very active. But did they do anything? No, they didn't do anything either. So we have the judicial one substantive change in a 200-year period, which was the uh, original federal versus Oatswaran in 1985. And again, dealt with the same problem, material misrepresentation. 
And what our court said, we don't like the English law. We've been applying the English law. We think we must go back to the South African law. So it's hardly a light, hardly can be called an intervention. It simply restored our law to where it should be under those circumstances. Australia had done that a couple of years earlier, and Britain followed us about two years ago and changed its law to make it much more sensible. Okay, so where were we? Common law of contract under the control of the judiciary. Not only in this country, worldwide, nothing. So, was it a disaster? What was the great thing that we needed which said we must change our system and go in a completely different dis distance? Well, the way we were, the rule of law, the rule of contract, virtually no changes, and where we had it, all they did is to do with what was necessary to regulate it. And when they did it, this is very important, this point over there. Intervention was clear, specific, identified problems. At most, we are talking about maybe one half a paragraph of law in 200 years, dealing with the relationship between the insurer and the client. The rest of it was how to manage insurance companies, and because companies are an intervention of Parliament introduced in 1844, obviously you're going to have lots of statute on how to deal with companies when they go insolvent, when they need to be liquidated and things like that. So that's what the law did. Okay, did it work? It worked like a dream. South Africa was a Rolls Royce of all companies. When I used to travel around the world, treated with great respect because we knew exactly what we were doing and we were doing it quite right. So wherever I went, I went to a conference and there was a delegation from India saying we want to get rid of the tariff but we don't know if it worked. I put my hands up and said, actually we got rid of that. 1975, don't worry, Indian, one collapse, the Russians were there. We want to introduce liability because insurance, we've never had it. I put my hand up, no, we've had liability since the 1900s, don't worry. It's not going to collapse, you know. So all going to, Singapore was going to introduce workers' compensation. So we did that in 1878. I mean, what is it that the world can teach us? Well, nothing. So what did we have? We had costless regulation. So in 1960, the Minister of Finance announced the government was going to appoint a single regular, a single inspector who might be able to visit insurance companies. That was the cost. Paid for what? The tax. So costless. We had two major insurers under that purpose go insolvent. The way the regulation the statute was drafted, they had to hold reserves. And those reserves were more than enough to pay the losses. The public suffered no loss from those two. South African insurers, world leaders, greatly respected, well above, punching well above their weight. Very small percentage of the world's premiums, but not as far as expertise are concerned. We introduced concepts like monthly premiums when the rest of the world said it could not do. We decided we would have multi payroll policies. The world said that could not do. We did it. We took premiums by debit audit. The world said that couldn't do it. We did it. They all do it now today. We introduced dread disease policies. The world said can't do that. We did it and it, it, it worked. We introduced corporate risk management in the 1970s, which forged a fantastic relationship between the industry and the insured, all working on a common goal of trying to manage risk. It was really wonderful to be involved with. We introduced the concept of the ombudsman 30 years ago. That was not costless, paid for by the industry on a voluntary basis. So it's worked without any problem at all. Industry in, in educated itself. It's established an edu education body, the Insurance Institute of South Africa, over 100 years ago. And it has educated everybody about insurers in there. And in, in the 1970s, they did something which affected me personally. They decided to insurance should be taught at a university. And so for the first five years, they funded the chair at Wits University, of which I was then appointed. So I'm here because of the great interest and intervention of the insurance industry to, to get things right. Well, with all of that, we can go home because the system works like a dream and does not need anybody to touch it at all. Unfortunately, we did touch it. Now we want to know what happened and why did we touch it over there. And then came phase. In 2001, because a couple of years of preliminary work past 2002, comes into operation in 2004. Now, why was phase passed? I must ask that question because this question has been put to the various ministers of finance over the years and they have become quite frustrated, saying, why do you think we would know that? I said, well, you pass law for a particular purpose and hopefully that purpose is met. So we have to go back and, and have a look at it. It was alleged uh, that the industry had a very high lapse rate of long-term policy. What's a lapse rate? means you buy a policy which is like a, a, a term policy but comes the end of the year you're supposed to renew it people do not renew it so people take out a multi-year policy but they only do it for one year <coughs> and then the view began to develop 
well, the public have been cheated on this because, look, they paid the premium and then they don't renew it and therefore they lost that one year's premium. They wasted their money and we have to look after uh, uh, the public just about that lost sort of money. And that was alleged to be brought about by mis-selling. You know, there's uh, intermediaries that went to see the clients to sell the policies. They were misleading. They were lying to the public and that's people were bought it on a false pretensions. Okay, so the argument was that what we need is a trained intermediary force and that would solve the problem of the lapse rate, which by that point of time when it was introduced was improving. So the lapse rate wasn't going up, it was going down. So it, one could have argued if you did nothing, the problem you thought you had would have gone away. But they said, no, 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 we can't allow this to continue this way. So we are going to bring out phase financial advisory and intermediary service. So the intermediary part was the thing that we need to, and the advisory, we're going to train them to give the proper advice so that this lapse rate would come down. So, and we are going to do it. Now, this is very important for reasons which we will see, because we now know why phase was passed. And usually, there was a cost to benefit study done. Now, it's supposed to be done on all acts of parliament. They are not done on all acts of parliament. This one, they were done. And so, and it was done by an independent institution, not by the government itself. And so they said, okay, if we get the lapse rate down, then all the money that the public are paying, then we'll benefit from that. So by reducing the lapse rate, we're going to make a savings. And they said, this savings is going to cover the costs three to one. So this is going to be the great winner of the, our intervention. This is what's now going to happen. At the time, the industry carried out its own survey. Unfortunately, I don't have that research anymore, so I have to go on my memory where the industry said, we have a lapse rate, but it's not brought about by mis-selling. And it's easy enough to find out. Let's go to those who didn't renew and ask them why they didn't renew. None of them have said it's caused by mis-selling. I'm thinking 0.0102% or 0.2%. The rest of it changed circumstances, a whole lot of other. Anybody who buys a product doesn't want to renew it. If you sell a million policies, obviously someone not going to renew it. I mean, so, so there was no empirical evidence to suggest the thesis that it was mis-selling would, would be able to do it. Secondly, a point which is very important from an economic perspective. You know, if a government is going to intervene, there must be some reasonable grounds to say you can intervene on that purpose or that purpose. Now, a lapse rate it's not clear to me that it's a legitimate regulatory objective. It's not clear we should have laws which look at a lapse rate. Okay, so the other, the other ground which is also quite important because uh, this act wasn't only for lapse rates for short term, it was going to make sure that our intermediaries were well trained. So the second ground given in this cost of benefit study in the short term industry there would be improved competition. The brokers and the intermediaries are now going to be much better trained. And when they're much better trained, people are going to make much better informed decisions and therefore we're going to get much better competition. And as a result of the improved competition, the premiums are going to decrease. And, uh, and that savings in the decrease for the competition is going to cover the other parts of the cost. Very small percentage they estimated, about 200 million rand would be the savings from the short-term industry, which would come from the reduction in the cost of purchasing insurance because now the informed consumer knows what he's doing. Okay, so that was a theory. So, well, what actually happened? Uh, we are now in a position that we know. Now, the very, very important point is in this case, the government told us why they're passing this law. So we can check it. In Twin Peaks, despite all our effort to get them to give us a defined reason, something we can objectively measure, they've never done that. So when we get to the Twin Peaks, we can't now say, okay, which we'll look at later on. We're going to measure it to see where this is. They made sure they gave no measurable objective because they knew the free market foundation is going to sit and check it. <laughs> so now what happened? Now, there have been several, seven articles written on the subject by Gary Moore, which is uh, does research for the free market foundation. I've drawn heavily from that. And the statistical information done by an, an actually in, uh, in, in, in Cape Town, Jeff London, and so... I'm using the, the, the data and which they have uh, done. So that's what happened to the lapse rates. Now remember, the lapse rate was going down when they decided to intervene. So 
It didn't go down. It went up. So it's the, uh, uh, the lapse rate. Now, there are two lapse rates which they measure. One is the end of the year, one year lapse rate, and then the, the other, the longer lapse rate. So that's the, uh, uh, the longer one, and that's the first year lapse rate, which was never. So you can see it went there, it went down, and then shot up. Now, remember, it was going down al already. Now, the 3 to 1 ratio which we were going to get was going to be come from this reduction in the lapse rate. The lapse rate doubled. So over the years, it's gone up. And that's why when they've gone to Parliament and said to the minister, what's happened to the lapse rate? He said, why would I know what's a thing called a lapse rate? What's that got to do with me? So that was why you gave it. So none of those savings were realized. Didn't save it at all. Now, if you want to be more astute, you can say, well, the lapse rate was going down. Why did it go up? And you can say it went up because of phase. Government intervention distorted the market. So government intervention did not achieve it. It actually went in the opposite direction. So the lapse rate did not do what this act was thought <coughs> was going to achieve. It turned out it was not costless. So it doesn't cost nothing. This is the industry cost per, B, uh, per employee of the Financial Services Board. So average cost per employee of the Financial Services Board, 1.2 million rand. So that's what's costing. So the day when the Minister of Finance stood up and said, I'm going to employ a single inspector, which will cost you nothing, it will be paid for out of the fiscus, that day disappeared with FAES. Because FAES was now a self-funded system. Regulator could decide how much money he wants, pass that cost on to the industry, who would pass it on to the consumer, and the, in, the regulator would be funded exclusively by a levy. And that's why when they put the Twin Peaks in the first draft which came out, the National Treasury was very careful to say to Parliament, actually it'll cost you nothing, nothing, nothing. Free of charge this stuff, because we will levy our own fees directly onto the industry and they will pay for it. You don't have to pay for it at all. Okay. Now, the whole focus, of course, was on the intermediary, that he was going to be properly trained and, and all the rest. And the intermediary is the opportunity for previously disadvantaged to get a job. Low cost, and you could start your own business, paid out of commission. So what one would have liked to see is this graph continue to go up, as we would have had more and more intermediaries come into the market, paid by commissions from the insurance company, funded and assisted by various companies to assist them to get that. So what we would have liked to see is we would have liked to see that happen. Instead, it dropped. And so we're now we're virtually where we were when phase was introduced. We have knocked off all the intermediaries and they've now got a new system, which is uh, RDR, Retail Distribution System, and that's going to get rid of even more intermediaries. So in the end, thing that was going to achieve this great thing has done exactly the opposite. First of all, lapse rate's gone up, and we're knocking out all the intermediaries we're not going to be. Now, although the intermediaries may have disappeared, the regulators have not. You can't see the figures very nicely, but you'll see we're going to end up with uh, something like uh, uh, 575 employees, we're hitting for 600 regulators now. And if you've been to the FSB's new offices, you'll know they are fantastic sort of offices. If you look at the annual reports and have a look at the salaries their senior executives get makes all the private sector executives quite envious of thinking, you know, we should really work for the regulator, that would be much better. So we didn't end up with a costless institution and we didn't end up with an institution which was going to achieve the objectives which it set out to achieve. Those objectives were never achieved under there. When we now put the Twin Peaks in, as I've said, that if you know the direction you are going to go, Lord Acton tells us, and if you stop it, it's going to continue in that direction. We have now got a, a billion rand to the FSB. We're going to double that according to their own estimates and the analysis which they did. Twin Peaks is going to cost between 4.8 to 6 billion. My estimate before they did that was 6 billion, so I'll stick to my 6 billion. They can have their 4.8, but they put the range from 4.8 to 6 billion. Now we're going to have two regulators. Let's just make a rough calculation. It's going to go from 1 billion to 2 billion. That's their estimate, not my, my estimate on over there. And then there's the industry cost, excluding that 2 billion is another 4 billion. So our costless regulator, which we started in phase, which was going to 
you have to get a savings of three to one, now ending up on a six billion rand cost. And what's it doing? Because it had came to reduce the lapse rate. It didn't do that. So if it didn't do that, why didn't they just close it down and say it didn't work, let's go home? Because when you put a bureaucratic regulator in place, it gets a life of its own. It works out itself what it wants to do. So let us do an evaluation of phase. On its original stated purpose, it's an abject failure. Simply the facts tell us at all. It ended up producing an expensive, purposeless bureaucracy. Purposeless because it had a purpose and it didn't achieve that purpose. And it quickly forgot that purpose. When I asked the minister, he would, said, look, I'll, I'll go and get the FSB to go through their records and see if they can tell me why this was started. But Parliament had long since didn't have a clue why it was over there. So it has not purpose. 600 and rising in the headcount, 1 billion rand set to double, and 2 billion additional cost imposed on the industry that is on the consumer. That 2 billion is what the industry is going to also pay. And uh, we won't look at that today, but that's really quite... Uh, significance. So, if you have a regulator that's got a purpose and it doesn't achieve the purpose, you quickly forget the purpose it's got, but nobody shuts the regulator down, and so it's got to go and invent itself a purpose. So, it acquires a life of its own, and it's quite a useless life. It's not one that does anything and achieves anything. Now, we can take that from the FSA in London because that's exactly what they did. FSA in London was formed after the bank, Fairbedding Bank's failure. The government of the day came to the conclusion that the Bank of England does not know how to regulate banks. And so it said we will establish a new institution called the Financial Services Agency Authority and it will regulate banks. And so it will do. The only trouble is nobody told it that's what it's going to do and it certainly didn't know it was going to do that. And so when the banks eventually collapsed, they got hold of Lord Turner and you can read this for yourself. who was the chairman and they said to Lord Turner, what did you do, what did you do about the banks? He said, look, I read the, the, the financial mail very carefully every morning. And everybody was worried about treating customers fairly. Nobody was worried about the banks. So I didn't worry about the banks either. Now that he's retired, he's gone around the world trying to tell people how to regulate banks, which he didn't do at the time. And he's now even written a book on banks. So at least he's learning. He hasn't gone back far enough. He's got to about 1900. He's got to get to about 1808 when he'll come across Henry Thornton who told him how to run his bank. So he's got 100 years still to go, but he's working on it. So at least he's beginning to over there. But the point is, the FSA was created for the purpose of making sure we do not have bank failures. It produced 100,000, no, 10,000 pages of meaningless regulations. And that's not my figure. That's the figure that Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Reserve Bank, he got one of his staff and said, can you just do me a favor? Can you go and find out what is the volume of, re of regulations with the FSA? And they came back and said 100,000, 10,000 pages. And what did they do? Did absolutely nothing. And so when we had the great global crisis, they said, we had better give the banks back to the Bank of England and let this other lot carry on treating customers fairly, which is what they think they can do. And let's get out of it. So, Insofar as the purpose of presenting, preventing banks from collapsing, it was useless. So it's a useless life all of its own. And this 100,000 pages, which everybody has uh, uh, now become understood to be a regulatory nightmare. Trump, as you know, one of the reasons he got into power was to cut back on the regulatory morass which has been, collect, been created. So it acquires a destructive and unacceptable life all of its own. Okay, now, this 10,000 pages of, of, of uh, instructions which the FA, FSA had issued to the financial industry, that is what one would call delegated authority to make law, subordinate legislation or delegated authority. In theory, the only body that can make any laws at all is Parliament. So Parliament is the sovereign law-making body. Now, about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, it was accepted that Parliament can't make all the detailed laws which are required. And therefore, it will allow the government to make its own laws which it delegates. And so there is an ability to make regulations, which is the most well-known which we have got. Now, it may surprise you that in our constitution, which is lauded as one of the greatest constitutions the world has ever had, it's absolutely silence on the power to delegate authority. So 
Parliament is the sovereign law making and one would think that it is the only body that can make law because nobody else. And if we are going to have a constitutional dispensation, then our constitution would spell that out very clearly. Well, it doesn't spell it out at all. And we had a very interesting act. I thought this was the most interesting piece of legislation I have seen and the most interesting court case which I've ever seen. Parliament passed an act. In terms of the act, it authorised the government to change the act of Parliament. <laughs> can you imagine? Parliament is the legislative body and it says to the government, you can change this law if you don't like it yourself. <laughs> oh, I thought that was like ridiculous. So it then eventually went to the Constitutional Court and a very brilliant judgment is in the Chief Justice Jackelson, Chaskelson, Judge President at the time, because uh, at the time the Supreme Court was regarded as the highest court. And then later on, they maneuvered that to make the Constitutional Court the highest court and they changed the President to become the Chief Justice. So that's the system which is in. And Chaskelson, a uh, very long judgment over there, and a bit, but a very interesting and, and, and uh, as one would expect from uh, uh, Chaskelson's very well written uh, judgments. He, got, he basically concedes, okay, our, our, our constitution doesn't allow delegation. But that's the way we've been doing all the time. So we must accept that it's an implied term in the, con in the Constitution. Then he makes this statement here, which is important for us. There is, however, a difference between delegating authority to make subordinate within the framework of the statute. The delegation is made assigning, but assigning plenary government legislative power to any other body. So you can delegate it, but you can't assign your pen to somebody else. So ideally, that means you'd have to find an act of parliament find the provision where it is delegated and then the delegated authority has to be within that provision. Now, unfortunately, that's not what happens in practice, as, as we will see in one simple example which we'll be able to do. The regulators increasingly have acquired the ability to issue these 10,000 pages of regulation with absolutely no checks by Parliament and no system to check by Parliament. So whatever they do, we will just assume that that is delegated authority when in fact it will not be delegated. Nobody is going to go through 10,000 pages to say that's right, this is wrong, this is wrong over there. So what we have ended up with a practical outcome as far as regulators are concerned and that is Parliament has abdicated. Parliament has said, carry on, we're not going to check, we're not going to look, you just do as you like. And the hope that that is actually only delegated and if anybody's unhappy then maybe they could take it to the court and let the court make a decision over there. Now as to whether this is delegated I just want to take one extract which has come out on one of the documents for public comment which is to do with the new Ombuds system and the Ombuds Council. Now the Ombuds Council will make sure that all the Ombuds work according to one uniform system which in itself is a contravention of the, the rule of law. But I just want you to apply your mind to this one statement which is made. The governing rules for all these ombudsmen must provide for cases to be heard on the basis of what is fair, irrespective of what is the law or the contract provides. You know, the ombudsman is not bound at all by any act of parliament, and the ombudsman is not bound by any court case or the common law. Now, there is no sane parliament in the world which would pass a law like that. Yet that is now, and this is just one line of the 10,000 pages of stuff that's going to come out, which has no basis in law and contrary to anything. So what we have is a parliament which has abdicated and has now handed over authority to the regulator to do legislatively whatever it pleases. So we have a system which is outside of the rule of law if that makes sense. So regulators pass a law, displacing the law, displacing parliaments, the courts, contract, and replacing it with the, or, the arbitrary opinion of the ombudsman. Now for those who've worked with the ombudsman system, you may think, well, we could live with that. Let me tell you what the problem is going to have. We can live with it today. We will not have a case going to court in the next 100 years. So 20 years or so from now, whatever is coming out the ombudsman will be vastly different to what we have out today because the ones we have today have some idea there is a law. That law will disappear with less and less application and in the absence of a Supreme Court, which is what has molded the law over the centuries. So we are going to end up with a complete legal travesty going forward. Okay. 
When was the regulator granted the authority to override Parliament, the courts and the contract? You won't find that anywhere. It's a power they've just taken upon themselves. They just put that into this latest thing for public comment. In future, we won't worry about what Parliament says, the courts say, or what your contract says. We will give you the answer ourselves. And you won't find that as a delegate. So in, in Chief Justice Chaskelson's nice, neat work, world, there is no delegated provision anywhere that does it, but that doesn't change the 10,000 pages of stuff which is going to come from the regulators which we are going to get. Okay, no system at all in place to check the regulator has not taken over Parliament's regulatory pen. So there's nothing in the system to do that. So what you have just seen, which is one line, that will be repeated over and over, and there is absolutely no system to make sure that does not happen. The net result is regulators can make any law, I should put law in inverted commas, because it's not really law, Parliament has abdicated. So we are going to go in forward into a world where there is no parliamentary law. We're just going to have thousands of pages of regulations come out, which will not make sense. Now, one could say we still have the court, and yeah, uh, this for me was really a, a, sh a shocking event, which we have, have recently had. Which for those who are lawyers and understand it, I think you would be shocked. If you're not a lawyer, you may not fully appreciate what happened over there, but let me just show you what just happened. We are said the Supreme Court has also abdicated. So not only do we not have a parliament, we also have a judiciary that has abdicated. So as in the case of the parliament, which says, look, this is just too complicated, too much. We're not going to read 10,000 pages. Do as you like. The Supreme Court has said the same thing. Look, let the regulator just carry on and do what he wants to do. So the great two triumphs, the common law and the Supreme Court, they are gone. They are not with us anymore in this one. Now to understand what the problem would have, which I'm going to do, we must understand a fundamental principle that we all understand. No man shall be deprived of life, liberty and property without the due process of law. That's a promise that each individual has. A.V. Dicey, the world's greatest constitutional lawyer, when he wrote his book in the 1900s, was very proud that in England every single individual has that promise. He then gave examples in Europe and the continent where people were arrested in the middle of the night, put into jail, never brought out, and nobody could do about it. Where the English common law is, that cannot happen. So we all have that guarantee. No one can put you and no one can take your property. And no one can do anything without the due process of law. Beautiful promise which we have. We have. Uh, uh, Mr. <coughs> Justice Van Vakers, Van Skolveg is a lovely definition of the rule of law which I'm very fond of. The rule of law is the barrier that the law sets against tyranny. So between you and somebody trying to take your property is not a man, it's not a, a something, it is the law itself. So the law would stop that. And if you have a doubt, just take it to the court, and the court will uphold the law. That's the dream that we have. That dream is now, I think, shattered. Okay, and the case I want is a recent case. Financial Services versus Bartum, 2005, the Supreme Court of Appeal. Bartum resigned from discovery and went to work for the old mutual. So this happens very common. People change jobs. Uh, also what happens quite often Discovery then sent its forensic investigators to interview him. Now, he'd already left Discovery. And so he said, I'm not too keen to talk to the forensic because I have of the impression you're just trying to set me up. And I don't think there's any reason why I should be set up at all. So, and and the, the, the interaction between him and the forensic is recorded. It's in the court record. You can read it for yourself. So the forensic, the forensic investigators could get nowhere. So they went and reported to the chief compliance officer. They said, I think he might be a crook, but he won't talk to us, and that's all we can tell you. So the forensic officer then updated the discovery statutory register, section 14 of the Act, indicating that Bartman was not a fit and proper person for reasons of honesty and integrity. Now remember, never got a, an accusation, never accused of anything, never had a hearing, nothing at all. So all they did is said, look, we think there might be something here. And she said, then he's a not a fit and proper person. So that's what she has done. Now, once Discovery updated their statutory register in terms of the law, they have to notify the Financial Services Board. And then Bartum became debarred nationwide. 
which meant once that appeared on the FSB's website, that is available to any country. So if he goes to Old Mutual and he says, Old Mutual, I will have a job. Old Mutual said, to hold this job, you have to be registered and uh, in terms of the phase. And we have to just quickly check whether you're registered and licensed. They said, you've been debarred for being grounds of dishonesty. So obviously no one in the country would employ him. He became unemployable now. No man shall be deprived of his life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Did he get the due process of law? That's the question. That's the only question. If not, that great promise that Dicey gave us is breached. In other words, you cannot lose your job. And the ability to get a job anywhere in South Africa other than through the due process of law, which means a judge of the Supreme Court, not a magistrate, a judge of the Supreme Court, would have to make that decision. Who made that decision? The compliance officer of discovery on no basis and no yarding whatsoever. A travesty in any sense of the word. So, he then makes an application to the High Court. The High Court then dismisses everything. So you think everything's honky-dory. This has done fantastically well. Set aside the decision of the FSB, sets aside the decision of discovery on an interim basis and said, you can now carry on with your investigation. Then the FSB, who was not party to the litigation, decided, no, it wants to appeal this decision, so it has to appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Okay. So, Bartham lost the right to work, the right to enter into a contract to exchange his labor, not by any stretch of any imagined shape. Can you say his right to work was removed in terms of the due process of law? The case wound itself, and for the first time, at the appeal court, FSB says that we want to be involved. And what's more than it, we have evidence we want to bring to the court. Now, the appeal court is an appeal court, not a trial court. So you can't go to the appeal court and say, I want to go and argue my case. And the best appeal court can say, we'll send it back if we think there's a value, but you may, must make a reason to overturn it. No, 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 we're not interested in that at all. We want to just make sure that the misunderstanding which has arisen is cleared up. The misunderstanding is that we, the FSB, will debar Mr. Bartman. No. Discovery bars Mr. Bartman. So the moment the employer debars you, you have no job with the rest of the country. Nothing to do with the FSB. The FSB did not want to be involved in that sort of process. Now, one would think at this point, the Supreme Court of Appeal says, we understand the common law very clearly. No man can be deprived of right, liberty, or property. He has been deprived of his right, liberty, of property. So this system is unconstitutional. FSB says, but you know, if you let Mr. Barton back in the street, there's a thousand others who all want to be back on. And we don't think we should allow crooks back on the market. None of them had a fair trial at all. So the FSB in the Supreme Court, instead of saying, well, you shouldn't have debarred any of them because your system is unconstitutional, said no. Discovery is the one that does the debarring. In future, if the employer debars somebody, you never get a job again in the country. A complete violation of the due process of law, which we've believed in for centuries. So this is the Supreme Court of Appeal abdicating. Now, if you think that I read, misread the case, let me just give you the quotation in full. Okay. The court below appears to have misinterpreted the legal effect of debarment in terms of Section 14.1 in holding that it precluded the representatives from acting only in respect of the debarring FSB. Discovery said, we have a statutory obligation to debar him. We've done that, and that doesn't affect anybody except us and Mr. Bartman. So we don't think there's anything over there. This is an absurd approach. And he said, the absurdity of this is the debarment of the representative by Discovery is evidence it no longer regards the representative as having either the fitness of property or the competence requiring. So the mere fact your employer says that you are dishonest makes you dishonest and you can't get a job again. An employer who does not meet these requirements lacks the integrity of honesty and integrity lacks the competence and therefore poses a risk to the investing public generally. Such person ought not to be unleashed on the unsuspecting public and therefore follows that any representative debarred by the employer must perforce be debarred industry-wide, rendering financial service to the investing public. No due process at all. The Supreme Court knew there was no, no uh, due process and was quite happy that an employer, without following any process, it's on the record there was no process followed. There's no indication the other thousand who was debarred, they followed any sort of process. 
So the guarantee that we've had for 400 years has disappeared. The Supreme Court says whatever the regulator does with his statutory system, that's his problem, not our problem at all. No parliament, no judiciary. You're on your own. <laughs> First time since the 1600s. Okay. The Supreme, fully aware of the persons who were deprived of the right to work nationwide. FSB said, if you don't do this, a thousand people want, 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 want their debom and set aside. So it was aware there were a thousand people who had been so deprived of the right to work by, you know, latent violation of the due process of law, extended the law. It's not what's in the act itself. This is an extension of the act. So that persons can be arbitrarily deprived of the right to work at the whim of their employer. There was no investigation. Simply the whim of the compliance officer. And the, the judiciary has followed parliament and has abdicated its function to the regulatory whims of the regulator. No parliament and no judiciary. That's the new world that we're in. Okay, now let's enter the Twin Peaks. This is the new system which we have, we have got. Now, one can argue that when we came to phase, the government made a mistake. It actually gave a reason for phase. So when we have a reason, we can check afterwards whether we complied with that reason. And we have uh, oh, nearly 10 years put pressure on the government to give its reason. No logical reason has yet been forthcoming. So the logic is simply the following. There was a global crisis. Please pass the Twin Peaks legislation. Crisis, Twin Peaks. So what's the connection between those two? And tell Parliament it's going to cost six billion rand per annum. Where will the benefit come from? Savings from not having another financial crisis. <laughs> so we will sit down and wait for the next financial crisis. And if that doesn't come, then we'll say, look, all the savings we're making every year, because we never had the financial crisis. In an earlier analysis, I said, look, the financial crisis actually emanated in the United States. There's nothing we do in this country to stop the United States doing what they do, so this is not going to make any difference. So there is no way going forward we can validate whether this system has achieved anything or will achieve anything. So it is legislation without a purpose. And we've seen that's exactly where phase became. It was a legislation without a purpose. What it does do, it does create an enormously expensive bureaucracy. It's an interconnection of a whole lot of committees. So we have committees after committees after committees, many of them international committees, which means the people who serve in those committees can get a first class trip overseas, first class hotel, and maybe do that two, three times a year. So it's a good life if you can get into the committee system. Is it going to achieve anything? Well, it hasn't got an objective to achieve anything, so we, don't think, we can't say it's going to achieve because no one ever said what it is going to achieve. So, plan A. First one, replace parliament. Okay, now, they've now institutionalized this. There are whole sections in the Act granting the regulator the power to make more and more laws without any provision for parliament to make sure we don't pass laws which says parliament's laws have no effect, Constitutions have no effect, contracts have no effect, so there's no way of checking that at all. In the thousands of pages which are going to come, that's what we're going to get. So, chapter 7, yes. now they've got regulatory instruments which they can do. Chapter 7, part 2, more regulatory instruments. You can have standards, prudential standards, conduct standards, joint standards. Chapter 12, we can have directives. So there's no end of laws that the regulator can now pass without any oversight from Parliament, as to the content of the law or how it's working in practice. Okay. So the example which I've already given, nothing stops the regulator passing a regulatory instrument, which is what he's planning to do because he's issued this for public comment. Can you please comment because this is the law we want to pass. The ombudsman shall do what they believe to be fair, not being bound in any way by the laws passed by parliament, by the common law applied by the courts, or the contract agreed to by the consumer. So commerce can do that to their like. No parliament. We'd ever dream of, we'd never be able to get that passed anyhow. Nobody's going to allow that uh, to happen. Part, plan A, part three, replace the judiciary. Now, the decisions made by the regulations are, ban are, are binding and actionable. So when the regulation makes a decision, he says you do that, and if you don't do it, you're guilty of a, an administrative action, and I'm going to impose a fine to you. That's not the system that we usually work. Usually, if somebody says you've broken the law, you go to the police, the police investigators, the police give it to the public prosecutor, the public prosecutor gives you a summons, and you have a right to defense, due process of law, and you appear before an independent judge. None of that 
Regulator says, in my view, you're guilty. Please pay 10 million rand. Or in the case of Primary Foods, please pay one, in the competition regime, please pay 1.5 billion rand. And what we would prefer is you don't argue, but you come here and you admit you're guilty and plead for mercy, and then we might make it a billion instead of one and a half billion. That'll be able to help you out under those. So, so replace the law, replace the due process of the law. In coming to that decision, there's no due process. There's, no, there's a court which is going to have a look at it. And in chapter 15, if you're really very unhappy, you're going to establish a tribunal, and then the tribunal can listen to your unhappinesses, which you're going to do. They're also going to replace it with the ombudsman system. You can have the power to ignore all the laws except what it deems to be fair under those circumstances. But there will be an overarching committee. And that overarching committee was to monitor and develop the best practices. So we will end up with a uniform system imposed by the center. So we're going to end up with administrative centralism. And that's not the rule of law. So where we started before 2001 with the rule of law, that has now all difference. So from whence we were to where we are going. Arbitrary rule by regulators acting outside of parliament or oversight. Parliament is abdicated. The judiciary is abdicated. A world without contract, a world without courts. We're in a world we never agreed to be and one we never wanted. That's where we have now found ourselves being pushed to in terms of the new system. Why does that happen? There's an old adage that power abhors a vacuum. If Parliament says we're not interested, the judiciary says we're not interested, as, uh, as, as Lord Acton points, power expands indefinitely. Somebody would fill that vacuum. So as the two famous institutions, Parliaments and judiciary, have withdrawn, so unelected bureaucrats have rushed in to fill the vacuum. And if you've been reading the World Press, you'll see this has happened worldwide. We just had somebody in Brussels take over the entire Brussels system all by himself. <laughs> so as Lord Acton, who died a long time ago, said, but I told you that's how the system works. You have an institution to prevent it. If you don't destroy your institution, parliament and judiciary, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to have a vacuum which is going to be filled. It's been filled. I told you that's going to happen over there. So we've gone in a very short space from a time from a rule of law to bureaucratic managerial centralism. And that is far better suited for a communist country than at least for a free country which we have got. Okay, so does it matter? You know, a lot of people say it doesn't matter. You know, If you're a consumer and you're now unhappy, you don't go to the court, you couldn't afford the court anyhow, so you just go to the ombudsman, he will rule in your favor, because they're all biased towards the consumer, so everybody's going to be, to be happy. The beginning of the beginning of the end. Now, why do I say that this would be, unless we stop it, it will be the beginning of the beginning of the end. Now, for those who like Churchill, you'll see that as an expression that uh, Churchill made. Who, they asked him, are we seeing the beginning, are we seeing the end of the war? And he said, this is not the end of the war. This is not even the beginning of the end of the war. But it is the beginning of the beginning of the end of the war. He said, from this day, inch by inch, we will win. Okay, now why do I say that? When you live in an age, you tend to think that this is the age which everybody has lived in. There's a very famous uh, 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 diagram called Desiree McCoxie's Ockistic. So it's uh, Desiree McCoxie is an uh, economic historian, and she has now plotted the prosperity of a society, and you will see it's flat. And then suddenly in the, 1900, in the 1600s, it starts taking off. And as she points out, in any one year, we produce more in that year than has been produced for the whole of society ever before. Now, why did that happen? My colleagues who are institutional economics will say it's institutions. Institutions matter. Parliament is an institution. The judiciary is an institution. They matter. So what is the institution which we put into place? Round about there. John Locke. He tells us what that institution, very difficult language because it's 328 years old. They tended to write in a much more complicated fashion those days. <laughs> takes a bit of I, I prescribed something to a student once to do the reading, and he came back, he said, he can't read it, he can't understand it, an honours class. I said, that I can understand, but what you can't do is you can't come to the class and tell me you haven't prepared the lecture because you can't understand it. So I'm afraid you're going to have to leave my class, which he did from that day onwards. Okay. 
John Locke said, if we want the system to work, and now John Locke wrote a very famous thing called the Second Treaty on Government, the most famous to this day, text on how and what a government is. If we want the system to work, then what we want to have is an established and known law by common consent. We need the common law. That's what we need. And that is to be the standard of right and wrong and the common measure to be decided with all controversies between men. Everything is to be decided and dealt with in terms of a common law. Earlier on I said the two great triumphs, the triumph of the common law and the triumph of the judici independent judiciary. And that controversy will be settled by judges, a known and indifferent judge with the authority to determine all differences according to that established law. So the only system which we could see to work and which worked since the 1600s is a common law presided over by a Supreme Court. So that's the great two triumphs. Those of what we have just de destroyed, we have already destroyed it, which we have got. The beginning of the beginning bag began with the rule of law, the law of contract, the due process of law. That has now ended. So in my view, we are at the beginning of the beginning of the end. That hockey stick will come down. And that begins with the end of the rule of law and the due process of law. Now, I hope I have made it very clear that in this Twin Peaks system, we have destroyed the rule of law and the due process of law. Both of those have disappeared. So the purposeless and meaningless phase marked the beginning of the beginning. It seems to me the purposeless and meaningless twin phase is but a continuation of the beginning of the beginning of the end. If you will not have the rule of law and the contract governing commercial transactions, you will not have a system that can work. Thank you. I like all the questions and ask Leon and he answers them. <laughs> Something that governs the most important sector of the economy in such an extraordinary and extreme way, in violation of any notion whatsoever of the rule of law or constitutionality, a breach of everything considered to be appropriate in a democracy and uh, in, in, in uh, the tradition of uh, finance and the emergence of the financial world. How can this be? And why is it that almost nobody seems to be taking it seriously? People don't seem to understand it. Uh, if I may say, financial journalists, very few and very rarely write about it. Uh, nobody, even in the Twin Peaks orbit, understands it, can explain what it's all about or why it's been done or what its objective is, as we've heard. And I have what I call the 10 no's, a sort of 10 point of things that are N-O, no. And this characterizes the sole exercise in financial services regulation in South Africa. Firstly, no need, no defined need, no objective. We've heard that it was meant to be about uh, uh, reducing um, lapses, the lapse rate. Uh, but in fact, that fell away and is no longer mentioned. And now we're just told vague things like protect consumers. Uh, we're not told in what way does the common law not do that. In what way do existing laws not do that? What, to what extent are consumers not protected? What protection particularly is lapsing? Just some vague promise of, you know, trust us, we'll make things better. Just, just give us all this money, give us all this power, and we won't tell you what we'll do, but we'll come up with something, and it'll be nice. It'll be, uh, uh, it'll be to the advantage of people. So there's no need, no defined need. Uh, nobody has lost any money due to a financial crisis or collapse or collapse of an uh, institution or a bank. Uh, we've, we've heard of Sambo, an African bank, and now more recently VBS. Uh, still nobody loses, nothing lost, everything seems to be working. 
uh, spectacularly, actually, you would have thought what we would say is things are running so well and everything is working so well, the last thing we should do is mess and tamper with it. No need whatsoever for anything new, certainly no need for something this big, this costly and this omnipotent, but certainly not omniscient. Um, there's no objective. We're not told what it is that's going to be better afterwards, what will have changed. What, what will be there that isn't there already or hasn't been there in the past. So no defined, no specific objective, except when we were told there would be a reduced lapse rate and we were told there would be a rate of return that is higher than the cost. That never materialized, so they don't even tell us that anymore. So now there's nothing, nothing, just some vague thing. Just, just endow us with power and give us lots of money. That is really all that we are told, and there is an objective actually, there is a stated objective, which is to create a massive bureaucratic empire and enrich those people who run it substantially. That's its objective, and it will be achieved. The objective has absolutely nothing to do with the financial markets, nothing to do with consumers, nothing to do with policyholders. Uh, there is no objective defined anywhere that has any relevance to anyone other than the bureaucratic empire and the people it will enrich. It has no skills. There is virtually nobody there who has themsel has have themselves been uh, successful operators in financial markets, who have produced and provided financial products, who have run financial uh, uh, intermediaries and service and product providers. Nobody's run banks, nobody's run insurance companies, so there's a complete lack of skills. And this is apparent from the sort of deluge of, of mumbo-jumbo that emerges in these directives and regulations and, and I don't even know what they're all called anymore. There's a whole sw slew of names, guidelines and, and, and what have you, uh, that come out. They reflect absolutely no understanding of financial markets, no understanding of competition, no understanding of capital, no understanding of investment incentives, and no understanding of the most important thing of all, according to them, which is consumers and consumer protection. Uh, so they, they, they lack skills. Then there are no benefits. Uh, we are not told of anything that is, is be anyone who is better off, anything that is better off, anything that is improved as a result of what we've had in the past, and we will not be told in the future. In fact, we'll be told even less. With one exception, in response to a question in Parliament in 2014, the Financial Services Board boasted about its only accomplishment that had ever been articulated and explained, which was to delist something like 15,000 financial service providers. Now, I think you all know that no banks and insurers and traditional brokers were delisted, were debarred, were, were, were prevented from operating. Who were they? Well, they were actually emerging, largely black, financial services and intermediary sectors, small and emerging businesses of brokers and agents, and there was a, a flourishing and thriving Black Brokers Association. Uh, it has vanished and disappeared, and they have been driven from the market. Now, it's not just this transformational emerging market that has disappeared, but it is, uh, it is their employees, it is their families, and most importantly, ultimately, the consumers, who they would have been providing financial products and services and insurance cover and so on to spaza shop owners and taxi operators and informal and small emerging business builders and so on. They are now deprived, and this is a source of great pride to the Financial Services Authority, that they are now all deprived of business opportunities and services. And uh, then there is no innovation. Uh, the, the guidelines, thousands of pages and regulations and the treating customers fairly one-size-fits-all regulations mean effectively that nobody can come up with new ideas, nobody can innovate, you can only operate according to what they say you can operate. Bearing in mind these are people that have not been in business, that aren't in business, do not understand how consumers and consumer markets work, but they will now effectively not fully prohibit, but largely inhibit and curtail innovation. There will be no competition. Uh, certainly it will be virtually impossible, it is now virtually impossible for any newcomer to enter into the financial services sector 
and uh, it will be uh, impossible and it will be in very difficult indeed to compete effectively, to come up with new products, new concepts, new ideas, and especially with the emergence of the tell of the internet and uh, the internet of everything and uh, you know the future in which essentially I all your financial transactions will be conducted probably on your cell phone. Why it's still called a phone is unclear because adding a phone capability is a kind of afterthought nowadays. But nonetheless, that is where the world is going and the idea that you even have to have intermediaries other than an app and that sort of thing is becoming, uh, th this does not allow for it. So it does not allow for the future, does not allow for technology, does not allow for effective competition and innovation. And then I have already mentioned that there will be no transformation. This is a way of guaranteeing that whoever is presently in will stay in. It is getting into the castle and pulling up the drawbridge behind you. And so this is no transformation uh, will be possible, or very little of it. Obviously, this isn't an absolute no, but it is a substantial no. No rule of law, and I'm not going to repeat all the points made by Robert Vivian as to why there is a complete absence of any hint of the rule of law. Any, any meaning which you can attach to the term rule of law is 100% absent in this uh, financial services policy and law. Uh, and then there is no protection. The consumers are not protected. Now, let me explain that. You might make a lot of provisions, for, exa for example, saying that, let's take in, in, in a thing that's easier to understand, but the cons current Consumer Protection Act says that there shall be no footstool sales of products. Now, let me understand that this is meant to protect consumers, right? This is meant to say, that if you buy a bucky, you buy an old fridge, you buy a plow, you buy a, a cow, you buy a, uh, anything you buy, uh, now has to come with a warranty. It has to be guaranteed. This is meant to protect consumers. In other words, everyone who sells you something has to give you a guarantee and a warranty. And similar ideas of what constitutes protection arise here, which I'll explain. Now, what is the greater protection for a low-income poor consumer? the right to buy something cheap without a warranty or the obligation to buy a warranty. This is actually an imposition on consumers, not a protection. This forces consumers to buy something they don't want, uh, namely warranties. They want, you know, some peasant farmer uh, near Babanango uh, wants to buy an old bucky for 10,000 rand, but now the law that supposedly protects that peasant farmer says, you may not buy the bucky as is, footstuts. You have to buy a warranty. And what's a warranty cost for latent defects and maintenance so on, on the bucky? Probably 50,000 rand or so. So now instead of buying a 10,000 rand old bucky, this peasant farmer now has to buy a 60,000 rand bucky. And what does the peasant farmer do? Just doesn't buy it and uses a wagon with a donkey instead. But animal-drawn traffic has been banned. So this is a victimization of low-income people. And so it is here. This is saying that consumers are forced to buy stuff they don't want to buy, forced to stuff buy benefits that come at a high price. There's no free lunch. Every benefit has a cost. So this is uh, uh, far from the protection of consumers. This is a violation of the right of consumers to limited and cheap products. This is forcing consumers to buy Rolls Royces and forbidding consumers from buying an old uh, Volkswagen or whatever it might be. And then finally, number no number 10, no socioeconomic impact assessment, regulatory impact assessment, cost benefit assessment. As Robert says, there was one at the beginning of phase. Uh, it he was, I think, quite charitable about it having been done independently. It was actually very badly done, but that's a different matter. And that's because it was one of the first and they were inexperienced. Uh, and it, it made predictions that didn't materialize, which shows you that it wasn't well done. But nonetheless, um, there is nothing like that now, nothing that pretends to give you a socioeconomic e impact assessment. Now, let me specify this. You can have a thing called a socio-economic impact assessment, but to be one in South Africa, it must comply with the prescriptions published by the presidency on the presidency website. You can download the guidelines for doing socio-economic impact assessments. They have to be done on policies and laws. 
In other words, at the policy stage, there should have been one. They shouldn't have had a policy without one, but we've actually gone all the way to the law, so we shouldn't have got near the drafting stage without one, according to the presidency the p and a cabinet resolution, and that is now reinforced by a unit within the planning department, a specialized socio-economic uh, 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 impact assessment unit, and uh, they are meant to sign it off and it, uh, they have to see that it's done according to the guidelines. Now, if you look at the guidelines, you'll see they're quite good. They say, uh, why is the measure necessary? What change do you think the measure will bring about? Uh, what are the problems that are called in law the mischief principle? What is the problem you want to address? Uh, well how will you monitor whether it's having those effects? So there's a very long set of very good questions that have to be answered and quantified. And when it says, what will the benefits be? You don't say, oh, well, consumers will be better off. You say, no, there will be so many fewer lapses. There will be such a, an improved rate of return. You've got, you specify uh, the quantification of what will be done. None of that has been done. Then there's a contradiction which I want to point to, a huge contradiction in South Africa that was repeated in the State of the Nation addressed by Rama, Rama, I wanted to say Ramaphoria, Ramaphosa. Um, and he said, read it, he said that we are going to alleviate restrictions and controls, especially on small businesses, and we're going to make it easier to do business, and we're going to relax superfluous laws or unnecessary laws, or words to that effect. In the same State of the Nation address, he said we are going to implement Twin Peaks. <laughs> Now, these are, you cannot be more contradictory because Twin Peaks is the exact opposite of what he said would be done, a di diametric opposite in the extreme. It's not even just a mild version. It's not like saying we are going to make things easier, but we are at least going to see that food isn't contaminated like Peloni or you know, enterprise meat or whatever. Uh, you, you, it, this is like on steroids, we will make things simpler, we will alleviate regulation, we will remove obstacles to small business, and then we will hit them with this giant sledgehammer when they're not looking and completely destroy any chance of any small business emerging anywhere, at least in the financial services sector. Not just as a supplier, this is important. It's not the supplier, it's not the operator, the service provider that's important. It's the consumer, the small business that wants insurance cover, that wants to have its investments made, uh, the worker who wants to have a medical or a pension scheme. These are the people whose opportunities are crushed. And um, then if I, if I may uh, uh, add, and it's not just uh, Ramaphosa, Zuma said this in virtually every state, same thing. We are going to remove obstacles. We are going to, de they don't use the word liberalize or deregulate, but it effectively is without using the word. They've all said they would do that. He said it in State of the Nation addresses. Uh, Pravim Gordon said it in virtually every budget speech. Ibram Patel said it in his departmental budget votes. Rob Davies have said it. They've all said it, that we are going to remove restrictions that stifle and make it difficult for small and emerging and transformational and black businesses to operate. And then what they themselves do is the opposite. They actually bring in new measures that will stifle and squash and make it essentially impossible to have transformation, whether it's racial or simply emerging new businesses. Then my final observation is this, that they have completely failed us and achieved absolutely nothing. They keep saying their rhetoric is we want to be able to avoid a financial crisis. They did nothing to avoid the financial crisis. South African banks avoided the financial crisis and, uh, uh, and not one of our financial institutions suffered. There is nothing in their powers or in their regulations that would have avoided the financial crisis. Now, bear in mind, there were two. There was the subprime crisis, which was particularly the American sale of mortgages backed and encouraged and promoted by the government. The government called on all the banks to issue subprime mortgages and trade the derivatives uh, with government backing. 
So the government absolutely caused the American subprime crisis. It was its policy. And only when uh, the mortgages became so much that the financial markets believed the U.S. Treasury would not be able to afford the backing, they stopped trading in them and then they had to be what's called marked down to effectively zero because there was no more trade in those derivatives. The second financial crisis had nothing to do with it whatsoever. That was the European financial crisis, which was a, which was a um, sovereign debt crisis, which was the Greek government and the, to some extent the Italians and the Spanish and the Portuguese, the, the, the Mediterranean governments, uh, that uh, incurred too much debt. They couldn't, they couldn't raise enough tax to pay their debts. So that was a sovereign debt crisis. Now bearing in mind that in Greece, it wasn't banks, it wasn't insurers, it wasn't travel agents, it wasn't holiday resorts at Mykonos and so on that went under. What went under was the government. People don't seem to somehow think somehow this had to do with the market. And somehow phase would avoid the uh, government from becoming getting into sovereign debt. It's uh, like ludicrous. It's, n it's got nothing to do with it. And it also were had no, would have had nothing to do with the, with the subprime mortgage crisis. As it happens in South Africa, our banking charter said that our banks would do the same, that they would give dodgy high risks to, to, to non-credit worthy mortgage recipients and the Treasury said that it would back them. So we absolutely replicated what the Americans did. But for some reason Trevor Manuel never issued the backing or the guarantees. Now either he was wise or lazy, I'm not sure which, but either way he gets credit for not having done the same to us that the American Treasury did in America. But our Financial Services Board, with all its power and all its promises and all its telling us that it's going to protect us, never saw the latest one, VBS, coming. Uh, to its credit, the Reserve Bank did, and as far as I know, it's the first time in South Africa, the VBS thing now on the go, the first time ever that one of our regulatory agencies may have avoided a financial uh, problem, d done what they said they'd do which is see that people operate uh, viably. They never saw Capitec, they never saw the ShopRite so-called uh, uh, reckless lending coming. Uh, afterwards, what was interesting, they accused ShopRite, you might recall, ShopRite was fined for so-called reckless lending. It was the, to be technical, the national credit regulator. And what had they done over a period where 50,000 credit agreements had been issued by ShopRite? Nine of them were declared to be reckless lending. By the time that was done, not the Financial Services Board, it didn't pick this up at all, all nine had already paid off their debts in full. In other words, they'd proven themselves to be completely creditworthy and ShopRite was absolutely right. They were creditworthy, they got credit, but they didn't meet the checklist of the National Credit Regulator which has now declared those nine people not creditworthy so they can never get credit again, even though they paid their debts. It is now reckless lending for you to lend people who are creditworthy money. That is what, how, how ludicrous this gets. But the Financial Services Board never saw any of this. It never stopped the Tannenbaum. It never stopped African Bank, never stopped Sambo and others bearing in mind that it certifies all of them fit and proper. It says they are fit and proper. Now, now, how crazy is this? You as a consumer put your money with somebody the government tells you is fit and proper. It turns out they're not, and you lose your money, or you lose your investment. PIC, for example, has invested heavily in these are civil servants lose their money. And just for what it's worth, one little technical thing with Robert, it is not the industry that pays the billions to keep this bureaucratic monster afloat. It's the consumers. It's the poor who have to now pay more for their policies, get less choices, get less tailor-made policies, get less innovation and so on. They are the ones who end up paying. So it has failed completely and dismally at achieving any positive consequence whatsoever at a cost of billions of rands and it is going to double the cost, double the size of this bureaucratic empire and fail even bigger. There, there will be nobody, I will take a bet on it five years from now, who they can say that person benefited from this monster in this way. They were better off because. 
Uh, they, cannot, they cannot do that for the past and they will not be able to do it for the future. It is a farce. It is an extraordinary, unconscionable farce for this to be proceeding and it proceeds because people glaze over when you talk about financial services and markets. Twin Peaks, Reserve Bank, treating the customer fairly, market conduct regulation. It sounds nice and fuzzy and warm and people don't really think about it and cough up the money, cough up the inconvenience, uh, stagnate the economy uh, out of uh, innovation and uh, this is what we're stuck with and what we're getting and it's all terribly sad and tragic. We have on our website, for anyone who has the time, a really very good uh, video on this which I encourage you to look at uh, that, that shows, for example, the build-up of that diagram that Robert showed and uh, I would hope you would A, look at the video and B, pass links on to everyone else and tell them to look at it and maybe it's not too late, it never is too late actually, to reverse something or stop something or at least do damage control. Make sure that its wings are clipped to the point where it's not as catastrophic as it now looks as if it's going to be. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Robert, you want to join me? Who can we trust? Can you say who you are, please? Uh, Peter Scott, um, so I have a question about the international comparison. So this is very alarming. <coughs> I don't know anything in particular about it, but it strikes me that the position of the American Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is somehow comparable in this bureaucratic overreach to our new regulators as well as in the case of the Wells Fargo misleading client um, they were opening new accounts and it came up later that they also have a blacklist in the financial industry in the United States and they were putting people on that blacklist similar to the bathroom case so m my question is do you know anything in the international comparison area specifically those two cases that pictures us as, as really much worse or much better or slightly better perhaps I don't know the details of that I would say that what we have introduced in South Africa has really come from the United States. I think they were the first to start introducing bureaucratic regulating systems. I think England and South Africa followed the traditional rule of law. And it really started in 1819, which was a progressive era, where they decided they wouldn't have a socialist system. What they would have is an interventionist government which would intervene. So I think we are really getting it, as you, you are aware, there's a big reaction in the United States, one of the reasons why Donald Trump actually got elected. And a lot of the things that he has done has been to roll back those type of things, which has received general sort of appeal you know, as to, to what's happened. So I think we've just been hijacked by an American idea, to be quite honest. It's not a British idea, but they've also been hijacked. Yeah? Did you have a question? Uh, I think in his case he's not going to do anything because he got a judgment to overturn the decision and I don't think they're going to change it. The disturbing thing is the decision the Supreme Court made that once a, once a company debars you, you debar nationwide. So I don't think as far as he's concerned there's a, there's a particular issue. He's got what he's want, but it's the principle that they've now laid down, which is what the FSB wanted because once the, once the judge had made a decision that the FSB is the one that must do the debarring, the FSB didn't want that, so that's why they went to the appeal court. So as far as he's concerned, there's no need for him to go anywhere else. The debarment was lifted, he's put it But it's the principle which the court has now laid down, which is very troubling to me. us, the normal man in the street, uh, can do to stop this monster? Well, I, I think the big thing, which is what I think is, is what I think we basically achieved, is an awareness that we're going in the wrong direction. Because until that awareness is growing, it will continue to go in that direction. So I think that we need people who are dealing in the day-to-day -day with this legislative nightmare to become more vocal. I mean, I think it's always been a matter of great concern to me is why the industry didn't react. You know, the industry always seems to, you know, we didn't get this debarment system 
but they didn't know about it. You know? And yet, why is it the industry didn't say, no, we've got challenges at a constitutional court level? So that's the bigger concern. But the more awareness there is that this is a problem, the better chance we've got that it's going to change direction. Without that, there will be no changing direction. If I may just add, I, I think as to why the industry doesn't react, yes, it is exasperating. But here the industry is having all these controls, the stifling regulation, the uh, uh, prevent or reduction of the right to compete and innovate and so on. But there is a vested interest. Uh, it's, it's getting into the castle and pulling up the drawbridge behind me. If you're in the industry, you actually welcome anything that makes it difficult or impossible for anyone else to enter the industry. If you have a range of successful products, you welcome anything that will stop anyone else innovating and bringing in alternative products that can knock yours out of the market. So, uh, and I think that's true in every industry. I'm not just pointing a finger here at our friends in the banks and insurance. No matter where you are, if you're in the motor industry, if you're in agriculture, if you're in, uh, you know, I don't know, if you're running dance schools, the security industry is a good example. What you want, if you're in the security industry, is laws and regulations that make it, as we do have, extremely difficult for new people to enter and operate. And if you're, let's use the cliche, white monopoly capital, you want laws that make it extremely difficult for black monopoly capital to emerge. Uh, you, want to make it, you want to make it clear that no one else will get in. So there is, unfortunately, a very perverse vested interest for everyone who is already in to stop anyone else coming in. That may explain the silence. Mike? Mike said this, um, yeah, I think you might be right, <laughs> because I think there are a lot of vested interests that are, are looking to be protected. Uh, interesting, you said it came from America. It makes me think of Edward Abbey, who said uh, a patriot should always be someone who's ready to protect his country against its government. And I think that's a situation we might have to look at here. Um, more comment, really, than a, than a question. Um, I think I think the one industry we've had, and we've already seen these type of so-called protection mechanisms in place, and the intent of some imagined need for protection is in the medical schemes industry, and we've seen the result of it: massively escalating costs. No, no real protection to, to the consumers. And an industry is now failing, and it has to reinvent itself if it's going to, to succeed. And I think this, we might look at the medical schemes industry as an example of why we shouldn't be doing this, just as a thought. Yeah, that's my prediction. This hockey stick in the medical industry will be that example that will start going down. It's, it's, I don't think anyone realizes how precarious that industry yeah. is right now. <coughs> there is a good YouTube video of Michael talking on the subject, which is a link on our website for which I encourage you to look at. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thanks uh, uh, for this talk. Uh, uh, it was highly informative. I worked at the regulator in the past on the implementation of many of these processes. It is exceptionally uh, complicated and hard with the whole infrastructure to support uh, uh, such a setup and um, on their side uh, just the people needed to actually monitor uh, for example fit and proper uh, are just not there uh, our country is just too small to support such a overarching oversight and to analyze that uh, feedback from the 10,000 pages it's not impossible. It's, yeah. it's, it just goes in there and it lies there because it's just too much for too few. And uh, like you said, uh, the uh, legislation behind it uh, and the regulation, um, it seems to be uh, becoming a moat for those in the castle. And it's creating a, a huge uh, hurdle for someone to start a, a, a business in financial services. So to start a bank, uh, you need to have 100 million now just to, just to operate it and comply with the uh, regulations before you even do uh, banking. And the other one is SatSwitch. Uh, SatSwitch, in terms of payments, it's owned by the big four banks. So if you want to do another payment system, 
if you go through the whole regulation process, would makes it impossible to build a system because the barrier to entry is so high. So I've been doing some investigations of why this situation arises. And many of it, it's uh, uh, because Bank of England does it. And they say, okay, why do you comply with Bank of England? They say it's uh, international best practice. But I'm saying uh, UK is the size of California. So it is not best practice because uh, China is, and India is a um, hundred times the size of UK in any metric. And they do completely different. They got their own setups with all their flaws and benefits, but you can't say it's best practice. And uh, the person who wrote these regulations, so that's the person I asked, why are we burdening not only uh, the watchdogs, but just everyone in the system? Because, uh, like you mentioned, if someone's deemed fit and proper, uh, that rubber stamp. If I see that, I'm saying, well, that person is fit and proper because rubber stamp, but that fit and proper, there's not much, uh, shall we say, credence to that because it's just someone who went through a process and ticked the box. I'm fit and proper and I wrote the exam in a couple of, couple of minutes. And, um, and like you guys mentioned, if they are fit and proper, there's no legal recourse to the FSB when you buy a product from someone who is so-called fit and proper. Whereas in the common law, if someone sold you a dud, uh, you, can, you have a recourse to misrepresentation, to negligence, and many other uh, legal factors. So my question is, uh, when you say the law of contracts doesn't hold anymore, uh, what exactly uh, do you mean, given this whole, shall we say, like you mentioned, this beast of check boxes and uh, 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 entrenchment of so-called big four. So the big four in banking is obvious, and there's the big four in uh, other insurance services, which is, uh, uh, I don't want to accuse anyone here, but it's all mutual sunlam uh, as a bit in a couple of years. When, a, when an ombudsman is in the future dispensation, is going to deal with a dispute, what you would argue is my obligation is what I agreed towards you. That's the law of contract. Now, in the new dispensation, so it doesn't really matter what you agreed. If the ombudsman thinks it's unfair, then you're going to get a ruling in your favor. So that makes sense. If you like a multi-billion multi rand example is the pension funds mis-selling in the UK. I don't know if you know about the pension fund mis-selling in the UK. What happened is the government decided to change the pension fund system and uh, from being an, an occupational pension to go and buy your own pension. So a lot of people went to buy their own pension. And then a few years later, they discovered the performance was not as good as would have been had they stayed with the system. So the industry was accused of being guilty of mis-selling, didn't do an analysis to show they're going to be worse off. But did they ever agree that they would do the analysis? Monsters, they never agreed. So in terms of the law of contract, they're not liable for anything. So how come they, they were held liable by the regulator to pay several billions of pounds? The regulator said, but I gave you a code of conduct, and my code of conduct said that you will do that analysis. So it's not what the industry agreed, it's what the regulator agreed. Now the regulator is not going to be guilty for, for contract, and the industry has been held guilty for something it never agreed. So if you had the law of contract, you say, it doesn't matter what the regulator decides, it's what I agreed. In fact, you know, in the court case, they said, but the, the industry never did this, never trained it, never could do it. And the industry should have said, no, that's right, because we never, we never said we would do that. So the basis of the claim, of multi-billionaire claim, was not the law of contract. It was the code of conduct that the regulator said, oh, that's what I think you should be doing. Vastly different, if that makes sense. To a lawyer, it does. Thanks for those comments. If, uh, I don't know if you're happy with that answer on the law of contract. I think the... In my also a lawyer, uh, the simple way I see this is that the contract is not what binds you anymore. What binds you now is uh, whatever the ombudsman, ombudsperson decides later. 
Um, but you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to have you, and I want everyone to know this is a very rare person who's sitting at the back there, and he doesn't probably even himself realize how special he is. He's probably one of the only people in South Africa who can name one of South Africa's most powerful people to you. Now, you think the most powerful people are the parliamentarians and the ministers and the DGs and so on. Not at all. They do not have a smidgen of the power of the members of the Financial Services Board. They can make laws, they can implement them, enforce them, impose fines, impose taxes, they can do all the things that a government can do mm -hmm. with none of the checks and balances and none of the separation of powers. And I would be very surprised if anyone in this room can name one of those very powerful people, more powerful than the President, other than the man at the back, the members of the Financial Services Board. Who are they? Who are these powerful people who can do all of the stuff that Robert was explaining? And there's somebody who knows. I'm sure he can name us a few. <laughs> yeah, operationalizing. But the chances are you could at least name one. Right. <laughs> uh, actually, I work uh, closely with all of them uh, because okay. I had to develop the methods to uh, monitor. We, have, we, have a, we have a CEO of a, of, a, of a financial service provider in the room, and I doubt he could name as much as one. But anyway, let's not put into the case. That last question, comment? Uh, just one last comment. So, a code of conduct, uh, which uh, we all know here, it's a set of, uh, shall we say, uh, values. The Five utopian months. values, um, which two people can always argue, mm. is that a basis for adjudicating a dispute? No, usually it was the actual contract. Yeah, look what happens when you go to court and you say that you breach the code of conduct and therefore you're liable. We have a case, for example, you know, it's well known that. Uh, short-term insurance brokers do not value property. So they will arrange insurance for property, but they won't set the value. We had a case where, you know, property burned down. It turned out it was grossly undervalued by several, hundred, several tens of millions. So they said, no, but the code of conduct says you would value the property. You would hold a, con a discussion with me and you would come and said, but the short-term industry never does that. The code of conduct was never drawn for the short-term. One size fits all. That's what the argument went to court. And the court judge says, well, the code of conduct says you did it. That's, Several billions of rands in, in, uh, in London changed hands on the basis of the Code of Conduct said But did the industry agree to do that? No, didn't agree to that at all. So the contract never applied. The code of Conduct applied. Never I agreed to it. Sorry. Eh? Hmm. Yeah, now on the question of a Code of Conduct, I happen to be involved today very strangely in a Code of Conduct. And the difference between a Code of Conduct and a contract and a law is very clear from the example I'm about to give. I was called yesterday by the chairman of one of the big four banks who said to me, could I please uh, become involved? And I'm not myself a great cricket follower, but I have some idea about the suspension of Timbo Rabada for violating the code of conduct of the, whatever it is, the cricket uh, board of control or something. And, um, and they want, obviously the Australians want him suspended because that could be the decisive factor in whether they win the series. And, uh, and so the South Africans want him allowed to play. Now, the point here is this, that they're quite correct under their code of, to have a code of conduct and to apply their code of conduct and they have to apply their code of conduct according to due process and the rule of law. But anyone is free to have another cricket body, another cricket association, which says that cricket is a contact sport and you're allowed to bump people over with your shoulder if you wish, you see. So the code of conduct is not a law. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not universally applicable. It governs only the people who agreed to it. And that is the difference between a law and a code of conduct. And then a contract, uh, if we go back to Hansi Cronier, uh, the point there that was an issue was, did his contract preclude him from max fix, match fixing? And apparently it didn't. So the irony is that you could be a professional boxer 
and your contract either says you may not fix or it may leave it silent or even permit you to fix as it does for example in professional wrestling so in boxing you may not in wrestling you must fix the outcome so so the code of conduct now imagine a wrestler who's agreed to let the other one win and the price all negotiated and so on which is what happens as was explained on larry king live by professional wrestlers and you go in and you meant to lose and you in fact go and win you see then you've breached your contract uh, but you maybe haven't breached a code of conduct which is to try and win the game just a little amusing thing uh, when larry king uh, had two professional wrestlers <coughs> on his program it's on youtube it's actually lovely to watch what was striking about it is firstly how bright they were i was quite amazed they were articulate these huge big supermen and uh, when and they explained how it's done how it's rigged how they rehearse they showed the videos of how they learn to do the somersaults and pretend to punch and hit and don't actually do so and what have you and then larry king said to them now aren't you worried about showing people on national tv that it's all rigged and controlled and regulated and, and it's not really kosher at all and one of them looked at him and he said you don't seriously think people who believe that stuff watch your program, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. And that note, I think that's probably the end for questions and comments. Thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, the next FMF event is on the 27th of March. It's an evening event, which you're all welcome. The media are very welcome. Um, and it's going to be quite a, a special evening because, as you probably know, uh, or may know, the Free Market Foundation has been going for some 45 years, and some of the founders are in the room now. And we're going to have an evening um, whereby they're going to recount the history, the founding, how it was founded, some of the stories they, all, uh, they were involved in, tales they were involved in, in a fireside chat around our fireside, of course. <laughs> So please come along to that. It should be very interesting and entertaining. I don't know many of the stories, and I'm sure many of you in your room, in your room don't. Can I just add that it's not just stories about the foundation, it's the stories about South Africa. Yes, the early days of South Africa, but also how the Market Foundation And involved. how we were in yeah. Including how uh, we contributed to the writing of the Constitution and other things uh, around that time. So please come along to that, 27th of March. You will be getting invitations in Otherwise, do stay around and chat and network. I think there may be some contact, I'm not sure. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.